So how do we, how do we avoid that, that fluctuation? Well, number one, don't kill them. Uh, the grenades, and there's organic grenades and there's synthetic grenades that kill everything. When you do that, you throw things out of balance and you kill beneficials. Uh, you want to provide water for them, but most importantly, you want to provide pollen and nectar for the adults that don't eat pests, and, and uh, that would include those little parasitic wasps that laid eggs in aphids that we saw. Uh, those wasps don't eat aphids, they just lay eggs in them. They eat pollen nectar as their energy source and nutrient source. And then some adults, like lady beetles, also eat pests, so you need to have a few aphids and things around for them to be there. And in order to maintain that kind of thing, we plant our gardens with the types of plants that provide that kind of food for them. So things that have an umbrella-like seed head, like yarrow and dill and fennel and, and your cilantro when it blooms in the spring, the, the coriander, uh, attracts small wasps. Uh, things that have a daisy-like flower, like chamomile and coneflower, black-eyed Susan, coreopsis, feverfew, zinnia, the fall aster, the, the uh, fall blooming aster and the copper canyon daisy. Those are all beneficial insect attracting plants. Uh, herbs that uh, have small flowers attract, they have what we call nectaries, the, a place for an insect to come in and get some of that nectar. Uh, when you mix these in with your garden plants, then you're going to tend to keep beneficials around. So when a pest problem starts to outbreak, you've, they're already there and they can kind of get on it and start to work on it. And you have to be patient. Uh, this is one of my favorite plants for beneficials, uh, the tropical milkweed or Mexican milkweed. I know there's issues with it with butterflies, but we need to cut it to the ground in the, in the winter, let it come back out again. Uh, to avoid some diseases and things. But look at this leaf. What do you see on that leaf? Okay, there's a lot of yellow aphids, which is the pest of this plant. There's a lady beetle larva. Every brown aphid has a wasp inside. And there's even two surfid fly larvae that are on that leaf. That, that leaf is a nursery for beneficial insects. So if this plant was growing next to your tomato or your rose bush or your crepe myrtle that also gets aphids. Uh, when aphids start to appear there, these guys are hatching out and flying around and doing their thing and you're keeping them under control. So diversity, this is in Bastrop, Texas. Uh, it's a cottage garden. Uh, it, it attracts a lot of things like that. Uh, you can go out west of Austin and see a cottage garden. Maybe you don't like the look of a cottage garden and you would rather just plant um, some trailing rosemary and some chives at the end of your vegetable garden row because they have little flowers that attract things or a Mexican milkweed for example uh, or other things. You can, you can mix these plants in and create a more biodiverse landscape and help balance out nature a little bit. Let's look at a few of the, of the uh, individual products. But the first one is insecticidal soap. If we were to say what is a organic spray that would be the first one that you ought to get and have on hand in case you need to step in and spray? I would probably put insecticidal soap up there. Uh, anything that's small and soft bodied, when you give it a bath in soap, it kills it. It's not a poison, it's physical, physically uh, damaging it and killing it. And so you can't just spray soap over the top of a plant, you gotta spray upward from underneath so that that spider mites hiding under the leaf get wet and the aphids around the stem get wet and that's how soap works. Uh, small soft bodied insects. Horticultural oil, what we said about soap is the same thing for oil except with oil we can add scale to the list of things that it controls because it, it sticks around and it smothers the scale. Scale have little breathing tubes that oil clogs up and so it physically kills them by suffocating them as opposed to by poisoning them. Horticultural oils are very safe and easy to use. Now, every pesticide, there's no such thing as a safe pesticide. Every pesticide has some negative effect. There's different degrees of toxicity. There's issues, there, there are a lot of other health issues. You know, is it a carcinogenic product or you know, does it have other things like that? But, but the beneficial insects are affected too. Little lady beetle larvae are small soft-bodied insects, and so soap and oil are hard on them. 
So I've showed you a bunch of pictures of like a little lady beetle larva next to aphids. If you see that and you spray it with soap and oil, you'll kill the aphids, but you'll also kill the, the beneficial that was there helping keep them under control. And you would rather have a few aphids to feed the beneficial. So one of the hard things for gardeners to kind of get their mind around is that a few pests are a good thing in, in many cases because they help maintain that balance. BT. A lot of things can eat BT and not be affected, but caterpillars can't because of the pH of their intestinal tract. It poisons them. And so most of the BT we buy is for caterpillars. There are strains that will kill mosquito larvae. There's a different strain that kills fungus gnats and a different strain that kills some leaf feeding beetles. Uh, but primarily BT is a caterpillar control uh, spray. You just need to remember with BT that it also kills butterfly larvae. So you wouldn't want to spray BT on your milkweed because of monarch butterflies or on your gulf or on your passion vine because of the gulf fritillary caterpillar that is feeding on that. So even a safe pesticide, safe in the sense of, of not being that toxic, we have to use not indiscriminately but wisely. And BT only lasts for a few days. Unlike synthetic products like seven dust that'll last a long time, a week or more. Uh, BT is only a couple of days that you're, you're getting benefit. The next product is neem. Neem comes from a tropical tree that's kin to china berries. Does anybody have china berries? Yeah, I grew up with china berries. Uh, one china berry tree and a slingshot keep a teenage boy happy for a long time. Uh, that, those are good ammo. Uh, but the neem tree releases uh, in its seeds, it has a chemical called azadiractin that is an anti-feedant and anti-development chemical to insects. They don't grow up. They don't go through their normal changes and develop. And they, don't, they lose their appetite. And neem soaks into plant tissue so that uh, you spray a leaf and it's not just sitting on the surface like a lot of pesticides. It actually soaks in. And so when something eats that leaf, it gets the neem inside and it does its work. But it works slow. So if you're a gardener who likes to spray bugs in the face, hear them scream, watch them drop off, and lay on their back and twitch as little X's form in their eyes. Neem is not your product. It works slower, but it works. And that's one of the things in organic gardening. We have to be more patient in working with nature, bending things the direction we want. So neem, neem works on things that eat leaves. That's a good neem product, uh, or neem target. Spinosad comes from an actinomycete. Remember that microbe? gives soil that fresh smell. Uh, spinosad is also for things that eat leaves, caterpillars and beetles primarily. Uh, they have to ingest it. If you live like down in the Houston area in places where citrus grows and you have the citrus leaf miner, spinosad is one of the best things you can use to control that leaf feeding uh, insect. Uh, but it works on a lot of other things. There's a lot of brands on the market and the one organic fire ant bait that I'm aware of has spinosad as its ingredient. So these are just a handful of many products that are out there that I think would be helpful when you have to step in, when nature, you know, you've, you've done all the things right. You've built good soil, you've chosen resistant plants, you've watered and fertilized properly, you've used mechanical and physical controls when they're possible, you've done everything you can to keep all the good guys around, and when it's time to spray, then we're reaching for the arrow, if we can possibly find an arrow to go in and take that pest out without having uh, to use a grenade and throw the, the balance off. If you want more information, I think the, the best website uh, that I've run into from extension services in the country is in IPM, UC Davis. UC Davis has this website where there's a button, that big square home garden turf and landscape pests is a button you click on and it'll take you right to individual pests, like if you've got flea beetles on your eggplant. It'll show you what they are and tell you how they live and where they overwinter, and then it'll start with the safest, most non-toxic option you have and work your way all the way through uh, more toxic things. And so if you're an organic gardener, you can find a lot of good answers in there uh, into how to manage those pests. If you like those pictures of aphids with monsters crawling in them, uh, there's also uh, uh, beneficial insect images on here where you can see some pictures of them. Uh, it's pretty fascinating. It's a good, a good source uh, of information.
I think I'll stop there. I've got, I've got to run. I'd be happy to answer some questions. Uh, they're doing, my book signing is right next, the next thing right upstairs. And so if you want to come up and visit a little bit, I'll be up there and I'll be happy to visit uh, with you more. Thank you.